folks, I want to welcome you back to the Louisville and Lexington ADU conference. This is the conclusion of our conference, and uh, we're pleased to be here with uh, Dan Parolik, who's the founding principal of Opticos Design. Um, so I'm not going to take a whole lot of time because we've got a really great guest with us here today, and I want to make sure that uh, he has all the time that he needs to cover his subject. So uh, what he's going to do is he's going to take a deep dive into the various missing middle housing types and their successful application in other cities. He's going to discuss the role of accessory dwelling units or ADUs within the missing middle housing uh, conversation, which is why this is an important initial step and why cities and developers need to think beyond ADU application to effectively address their housing issues. So um, Daniel Parolik is an urban designer and architect, author, and founding principal of Opticos Design, a B corporation focused on equitable urban placemaking, innovative housing design and policy, and zoning reform for walkable urbanism. Daniel and his work have been featured in many high-profile publications, including the New York Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, Next City, Fast Company, The Wall Street Journal, and Curb. Daniel has championed the missing middle housing movement, launched missingmiddlehousing.com, and wrote the book Missing Middle Housing, Thinking Big and Building Small to Respond to Today's Housing Crisis, which is now available from Island Press. As a thought leader in zoning reform efforts to remove barriers for walkable urbanism, Daniel co-authored the book Form-Based Codes, a guide for planners, urban designers, municipalities, and developers with Karen Parolik and Paul C. Crawford, named one of Plan Edison's best books of 2009, and co-founded the nonprofit think tank, the Form-Based Code Institute. His innovative work is diverse across public and private sector clients and includes a master plan, building type design and architecture for cul-de-sac Tempe, which is fully entitled and will be the largest car-free community in the country when built in 2021. Daniel uh, also is, um, a frequent presenter and recently served as a board member of Transform. He has a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Notre Dame and a Master of Urban Design from the University of California at Berkeley. He's inspired by international travel, especially in Italy. The seeds of his passion for walkable places started while he was growing up in the small town of Columbus, Nebraska. So uh, Dan, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it sounds like you've had a very successful conference uh, to date discussing ADUs. I, I really love this idea of, of mornings with planning. I think it, it makes the discussion about all of these planning and zoning topics that seem very technical and somewhat unapproachable, more approachable. And I think it really encourages more people to to come to the table and join the conversation. And I feel like that's one of the primary reasons that the concept of missing middle housing has been so successful is that um, it, it's given cities, architects, developers a way to talk about the need for these broad range of housing choices without using uh, the terms that come come with a lot of baggage like density and multifamily or even apartments and makes it much more approachable and informs the conversation. So my presentation today is called Missing Middle Housing, Thinking Big and Building Small to Respond to Today's Housing Crisis. So I think I, I always like to start out by talking about the fact that people in, in households want and need different housing choices, regardless of where you are in the country from big metropolitan areas to small rural communities. And um, I love that um, you've initiated your efforts and, and established ordinance to enable ADUs to, and, and I think that's a great way to plant the seeds for housing choices, but I think the logical next step is opening up this discussion about the broader range of missing middle housing types that I'll talk with you about today a little bit more. And one of those types is represented in this photo here. It's, it's a cottage court. And this is a type that a lot of people really love, um, that cities have actually made efforts to enable these housing types in their communities. And I think that um, what the sad reality is, you know, this isn't um, 
out of scale. This isn't imposing. You could imagine this in a lot of different places across the Lexington and Louisville metro. Um, but it's actually illegal in, in a lot of, um, in, in a majority of cities and a majority of neighborhoods across the country. So um, it's just like one of the tests I often tell, uh, sort of give to cities after I were either working with them or, or I present to them is like, is a housing type like this, that's 18 dwelling units per acre, super small lots, super small units, um, actually enabled by your zoning in a broad range of geographic locations in your city. So it just opens up that conversation. And the sad reality is that we knew how to deliver these types historically. In the early 1900s, you could actually pick up a Sears and Roebuck catalog and um, order a fourplex or order a sixplex. And we've gone a really uh, long way in the wrong direction, unfortunately, uh, for the delivery of these missing middle housing types. And so why is it important to prioritize this discussion and prioritize efforts in your policy and your planning uh, to enable these broad range of missing middle housing types? I always like to sort of set that foundation before I dive into what it is and sort of how it's being delivered. The, the demand for missing middle housing is extremely high. Um, Arthur Nelson, who wrote a chapter uh, in my book, Missing Middle Housing, uh, who's a national expert on, on household demographics as well as um, demand for different housing types. This is a quote from his that uh, between 2017 and 2040, that 62% of all new housing completions would need to be missing middle housing to meet the demand. So, uh, you know, it puts, it puts a city in a good position if they're enabling this and it puts a developer and we've worked with a lot of them on projects like the one behind me here in a really great position um, if they're delivering uh, to meet that demand in their different in their different markets. So right, we have a rapidly aging population. Um, this is one of the primary reasons that ARP, who is the host of, of, of this presentation, has become one of the biggest um, proponents and supporters of missing middle housing across the country as part of their livable communities. And so, right, one in three Americans is currently 50 or older. And by 2030, one out of every five people will be over the age of 65. So we need to be thinking about very differently about both the types of housing that we're delivering that will meet the needs of this aging population, but also the types of communities that we're delivering that can give them access to the amenities that they need um, and, and deliver a healthy community um, in the pattern of the community that's being delivered. Um, so there's also a shifting demand uh, for walkable living. And, you know, the two biggest market segments, the millennials uh, and the baby boomers both want missing middle housing. Two thirds of millennials uh, prefer missing middle housing and one third of baby boomers. So if you're not addressing this as a city, you're kind of missing sort of that that demand and if you're not addressing this as a developer you're also missing that demand in terms of not just the housing type but also the walkability that large percentages of households are actually looking for and um, i think we all know this that uh, affordability has really gotten much worse um, 31 percent of households um, uh, this was from 2017. I think it's gone up a little bit more in the last couple of years. Our housing costs burdened, which means they're spending more than a third of their income on just housing. And if you add transportation costs to that, you know, you're talking about 40 or 50 percent of a of a household's income just on housing and transportation. And it's getting to be really a, a crisis level in a lar lot of places across the country, not just the major metropolitan areas where it was an issue you know, has been an issue for quite some time, but even uh, we're seeing this in really small rural communities as well that have a shortage of housing. Uh, it's become really expensive to deliver new housing, whether it's rental or for sale, and, and households are really struggling with this. And, you know, the other thing is that, right, racial inequities have really come to the forefront over the course of the last couple of years in a good way. And we just need to acknowledge that our zoning and housing and, and planning um, played a major role in, in the impact of, of, of Black households and the racial wealth gap that currently exists in this country. I think the this um, Washington Post article and, and others that I've seen shows that there's a, 
that the, the, the average black household has a, a wealth of 10% of the average white household. And so largely based on inequities we created and, and, and the inability for those households to uh, create wealth through the ownership of, of their homes. Um, just something we're, we're needing to address. And I do wanna acknowledge that Emily Liu and her staff, I know they did a really excellent work on uh, addressing and analyzing their development code with a racial equity lens. So I just highly encourage you to take a look at that as part of that discussion. So what is missing middle housing? Um, I'm gonna do this pretty quickly and jump into some examples, but I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. Many of you have probably seen this diagram but there's just a couple of message points that I wanna make sure you we all walk away with when we're setting a foundation for a missing middle conversation. We define missing middle as house scale buildings with multiple units and walkable neighborhoods. And you can see on this diagram that we created now a little over 10 years ago, actually, that you have single family detached houses on the left. We've done a really good job delivering those. You have the larger, more urban buildings on the right, which we've, the last 10 to 15 years, most markets have figured out how to deliver. And it's all these housing types in the middle, like the duplex, triplex, courtyard apartment, bungalow court, a townhouse that um, we've built very, very little of um, in the last five to six decades. And that's part of the reason we're in this attainability, um, having attainability issues right now. And I want to say that it's really, really important in the communication and messing, messaging that first and foremost, that the middle in the missing middle housing is form and scale and a range of specific building types. Um, it's really, really important part of this. So that house scale that's in that definition is probably the most important concept. If you go away from this presentation today with one concept, go away with missing middle equals house scale. Because you can see this building on the right, you could drive by it, ride your bike by it, walk by it, and not even notice that uh, looks looks and behaves like a single family house, but there's actually three units in it. So it's a triplex. And that's part of the idea here is these buildings, house scale with multiple units and really, really important part of it. So the housing types, there's this, this range of missing middle housing types. If you uh, go to missingmiddlehousing.com or if you pick up a copy of my book, you'll see a very detailed overview of each of these building types. And it's really important for all of us to understand and start to communicate sort of using this terminology of these building types. And it's not just about a number of units on a lot, but just as importantly as a specific, that specific form and scale that I will, will keep talking about through my presentation. And uh, we created this new diagram uh, as part of my book because most cities in their zoning really concentrate very heavily on just the height in terms of thinking about compatibility or appropriate scale. But what we've realized over now, uh, we've been actually writing zoning and form-based coding to deliver missing middle for over 20 years, is that it's just as important to regulate a maximum width along the street frontage, as well as a maximum depth into the lot to deliver that predictable house scale um, in the missing middle housing types. And then secondarily, the middle means um, affordability, affordable to middle income households or attainable is probably a better word to middle income households or what we call affordable by design. So it's not getting a subsidy. So this diagram shows you know, the role of missing middle in the affordability conversation. On the left-hand side, you have subsidized sort of what we call capital A affordable housing, uh, which there's an important place for in terms of delivering to to sort of lower income, below medium income households on the right is simply increasing the, the supply so that the, it controls the cost. And then right in the middle is where missing middle sets, sits in the affordability conversation is where it's being delivered uh, by market rate developers and just by thoughtful design, by efficient um, building types, um, multiple units, it's it's being delivered at, a, can be delivered at attainable price points. And I'll talk about a couple of examples in just a little bit. I, I like this term, um, you know, historically these missing middle types in a place like a Chicago, uh, Louisville, Lexington has these types um, in any neighborhood built prior to the 1940s. Um, I, I saw an article that called these the working man's palace where a household 
that maybe couldn't quite afford a single family home, could buy a two flat or a three flat, let the income of that second unit help them pay their mortgage and build, um, provide housing stability and build uh, household wealth. And so I, I like that concept a lot. And so why do we call it missing? I mean, you can see uh, that this diagram, uh, which we created from the for the book based on the data from the American Housing Survey that between 1990 and 2013, that less than 10% of all housing units produced were missing middle scale. And I would, I, I think I saw some recent data that showed um, that that's gone down to like 5% or even less in the last five to six years. So, so it is really missing from the housing delivery system. Um, I wanted to take just a couple of minutes since this is an ADU conference to talk about how ADUs sort of fit into the missing middle uh, conversation. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know, ADUs in my neighborhood, because there's actually three different ADUs going up on my block, and I love to see it, and I love the stories behind it. Um, the missing, the ADUs were originally part of that, that list of missing middle housing types, whether it's on our, on the missingmiddlehousing.com website or in the book, but we decided to actually uh, fairly recently take it off the missing middle site only because we felt there was enough of, of its own momentum the ADU conversation had progressed uh, forward enough that we, you know, we could take it out of the missing middle lexicon. But it is an important part of uh, uh, of a toolkit of housing delivery that we tell cities they need to be looking about, looking at. I um, just want to want to summarize, you know, some of the personal stories um, of ADUs in my neighborhood. On the right hand side here uh, is a one and a half story, eight hundred square foot ADU that we actually designed for friends and neighbors. And it's a, it's a couple with two teenage kids. Um, they were living in a thousand square foot historic bungalow and they built the ADU in the short term to basically function as a larger family room that their smaller, older house didn't have. And in the longer term, they actually plan on moving into that ADU and renting out uh, the, the front house um, to just generate income toward the end of their careers or in their retirement. In this upper left uh, is a thousand square foot ADU that's being built at the rear of the lot um, just around the corner from my house. Uh, it's an older couple. Uh, they're in their early sort of mid 80s and their children and, and their children cannot find an affordable place to live in the same town that they grew up in that their parents grow up in. So the old elderly couple is going to move into the thousand square foot ADU and their kids and grandkids are going to move into the front sort of existing home. And then down on the bottom piece is like a sort of a, a small example where the woman in the that light green house, a neighbor of ours, uh, is building a 400 square foot ADU. You can see it under construction with the blue uh, wrapped uh, weather, weather paper, weathering paper, waterproof, uh, waterproofing. And she's doing that because she's really struggling to, to pay her mortgage. And so she wants to build that small ADU to help supplement her mortgage payments um, in a really uh, high value market. And so I just wanted to share some of those stories because I tell, I tell cities, I tell developers, I tell even had conversations with AARP that personalizing these discussions is really important. So to make them a lot less intimidating for, for folks who are less um, sort of plugged into and, and used to talking about planning and and some of these housing choices. So how are developers delivering? Um, we've had the opportunity to work with some really uh, innovative developers um, and across the country to deliver some really interesting projects. But what we're finding is that in a large majority of the markets, even in places like uh, Boise, Idaho and uh, Missoula, Montana, it's become almost impossible to deliver single family homes at attainable price points. And so, so we're, we're working with developers in a lot of instances to shift their single family entitlements to enable a broad range of missing middle housing types. It might include some smaller lot, single family detached, but then in, you can see some of these diagrams It includes fourplexes, cottage courts, uh, townhouses, a really nice mix of missing middle. And the missing middle uh, is not just a, a concept and a term that's being lauded by planners as a great planning idea, but the development community has really um, accepted it and made it a part of their lexicon and communication. This great um, report on attainable housing 
uh, released now a couple years ago by the U by ULI, the Urban Land Institute, um, created by RCL Co. One of the three uh, tools that they propose for developers to deliver attainability is missing middle housing, and so it's it's highly accepted by the development industry across the country, and um, it's being applied in, in 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 a lot of different markets. And so, the first project I just want to show you is a project that we're working on in um, the Omaha, Nebraska metro uh, in a small town called Papillion, which is really at the edge of the metro. And it, this project is really redefining what multifamily living can be like by integrating missing middle in a neighborhood format. And it's called a bungalows on the lake or prairie queen. And the idea behind this, the big idea is that we're designing buildings, a set of buildings that look like these turn of the century mansions, but that just happen to have, you know, five, six, seven units, seven in this particular instance, units integrated into them. And back to that idea of house scale buildings. And so this is a 50 acre project. There will ultimately be uh, 740 units. They range in size from about 740 up to 2,400 units. And it's about 15 units uh, per acre. If you can conclude all the open space that's included, it's about low sort of 22, 23 units per acre if you uh, carve out all that undevelopable um, land within the project. But, you know, this, this photograph tells a lot. They're about 300 units in. Um, there are in the foreground are live work units with a ground floor flex space and a townhouse above it. Um, townhouses to the right, and then the rest of the neighborhood is a mix of duplex up to eightplex um, laid out in a street and block network. And um, this project is performing extremely well for our client. Um, and people, the market really seems to be responding and, and, and loves this. And you can see it looks and feels and behaves like a neighborhood. Um, you would, you know, you could drive into one of these streets um, and not actually know whether these are single family homes or um, you know, multi-unit missing middle apartment buildings. And sort of on the lower right, it's a sixplex, right next to it is a fourplex. Um, then right here in the, this L-shaped building is a fiveplex and you can see it's all um, parked in the rear with Ellie's. And you can see there's even some ADUs are, are a critical part of making this project pencil out, getting enough units uh, for our client and making it pencil out. And um, there's a ton of variety. It's not just taking one or two types and repeating it, but rather this collection of six or seven different missing middle types and providing them in, in a way that creates a lot of variety in form and scale and um, it, which is really important to the quality of the community. And this is just a picture of one of the alleys with a couple of ADUs above it. Um, thoughtful approach to parking was really critical. This is a suburban location, uh, but it functions primarily because, sorry, one of the, the ways we were able to deliver this sort of placemaking is, is there's one off-street parking space per unit, and then the rest of the parking occurs on the street. And it hasn't impacted the rents. Our, our clients actually getting the highest per square foot rents of any uh, rental project in the entire Omaha Metro. And people actually like to park on the street and walk up to their front door uh, and go through the porch as opposed to walking through a parking lot and, and you know walking a quarter of a mile to their unit and then down a long corridor. So um, the street design uh, sort of narrow streets and on street parking are really key to the success of the project, um, but also uh, important and necessary for the success of the placemaking component of this as well. Uh, a second case study uh, are uh, uh, another project that we designed. They're called the Muse Homes. And this was in a project in the Salt Lake City Metro. Um, our client came to us um, with two issues. They could, number one, they couldn't actually deliver a townhouse at a price point that was a, a affordable to an entry level a buyer. And then second of all, they knew that, um, that there was a shift for a demand for more walkable communities and their business model was historically based on delivering large single family suburban homes. And they wanted to transition their business to address this a demand for that walkable living in missing middle housing types. And so um, this pro project actually took a, a challenging site where there are two blocks 
each about three and a half acres within um, a larger master plan community. And in orange, you can see the are the, the white muse types that I showed in the previous picture, but we split the two large blocks into each into four blocks by doing a pedestrian only walkway going both east and west and north and south through the site. These generated about uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 units per acre, depending on how you calculate that density. And um, our client was able to deliver these at a price point about $25,000 less than their townhouse. They started at $189,000 and went up to $220,000 in the first phase. And those prices went up about, I think about 20% over the course of the last three to four years, just based on the, the craziness in the market right now. But they're still quite a bit lower um, uh, than sort of competing uh, projects. And just because uh, we delivered that at attainable prices, we, we wanted to prove that we can deliver good design at an attainable price point. And one example of this is just this really nice two-story living spaces that a majority of the units have and feels more like a, a loft space. Um, a couple more projects, just a quick glimpse. So this is a cottage court project. Back to that initial slide of, you know, if you really want to think about enabling a broader range of types, uh, you know, this might be the next step after ADUs is the cottage court. Uh, this is a project that we master planned in, in um, Northern California that has eight primary units that are, there's two different cottages, one's 1,200 square feet and one's 1,700 square feet. And then there are four ADUs that are all 500 square feet. And those ADUs are sold um, uh, with the main unit. And it's about 1.37 acres. And you can see on the left is just an aerial photograph of the units oriented around that that main sort of shared community space. Um, and it's a really important part of that. And then a series of secondary spaces tearing off that. These units have, uh, the master plan has a, an alley on each of the edges that is access to the parking. And then um, this, just once again, I wanted to show that the COD, these, these ADUs played a critical role in the viability of this project. And, the buyers are, a lot of them are downsizing from a larger single family detached house. Um, you know, they're, they're buying a 1200 or a 1700 square foot unit and they love having the ADU either because like right now they're working virtually and can make that their home office or when their kids visit, um, you know, they can, or any other guest visits, they can use their ADU or they just, they, they can rent it and um, generate revenue to help them pay uh, for the price of the home. And the last project, which um, is one we're designing in Seattle, and I just wanted to show this because Seattle approaches ADUs uh, quite a bit differently than most cities. And I actually really like it as we're designing under their zoning, where the the ADUs can actually be sold separately from the what they call the primary unit. And this is a, 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 a clustered sort of courtyard housing project on uh, just under 0.8 acres. It has 15 primary units, eight ADUs, and 17 parking spaces, about 30 dwelling units per acre. But it has, if you look at these white buildings, um, there's two and a half stories in each of them. Some of the units have a full two and a half story townhouse and others have a ground floor ADU that could either be sold with or separately from the townhouse and then a two and a half story townhouse above it. And those units range from um, just under a thousand to 1400 for the primary units and a little over 500 to 800 square foot for the ADUs. So then jumping to um, you know, planning and zoning for missing middle, what are cities and counties doing with their policy, their planning and their zoning to enable missing middle housing? And, and the first thing that I wanna note is that um, you know, just encouraging cities and counties to avoid, avoid a one size fits all solution, that a real place-based approach is really the key to successful application of missing middle where you know, if you're, um, you know, size of units, amount of parking might be different uh, in terms of viability in different locations of your uh, broader metro in a city or in a county. And I just want to note, I wanted to show uh, Beaufort County, South Carolina, because, um, you know, it's not a big 
major metropolitan area. It's a fairly rural context. And we worked with Beaufort County to create a framework for their comprehensive plan and then create a set of a, a form based code template um, to enable missing middle housing across different um, types of communities across the country. So we identified this broad range from a rural crossroads up to a city and created a different approach for each of those different types of places. And what was great about this is that it established um, a hierarchy of places countywide to, to establish both where growth should go, but also what type of growth should go in those designated place types. So it was a really interesting strategy to enable this broad range of housing choices. And there was a, a shared um, um, code template that was um, shared across multiple jurisdictions um, across the county. And uh, another part of this message is that successful missing middle um, implementation really needs to start at your comprehensive plan with some really solid policy to um, <clears throat> give both planners and decision makers the, the support they need you know, when the, the concepts come up and are proposed and, and there may be some pushback on it. So we need some really solid policy. Uh, we worked on a range of, of comprehensive plans ranging from places like Memphis to Kauai County um, that have made Missing Middle a core part of the, the, the plan, the sort of future plan and, and policy for the community. So I just wanna encourage that. So where in your communities uh, should you consider applying Missing Middle? I just like to give this quick overview. You know, there's small individual lot infill, whether it be, you know, one or two lots in a, a pre-1940s neighborhood or a half an acre, an acre, two acres, um, some place a little bit further from the downtown core we're seeing as, as great opportunities. Um, secondary corridors, you know, maybe where there's been disinvestment over the, the, a couple of decades, or there's vacant lots, or there's even commercial that um, is no longer viable because it's moved further and further out into the, you know, into the city's edges. It's great opportunities to think about application of missing middle housing. Transitions from higher intensity corridors, if your zoning asks for, you know, or allows, you know, four or five, six story buildings along a specific corridor, we find the missing middle as a great transition from those bigger corridor, that bigger corridor development into the neighborhoods that are adjacent to them. <clears throat> and then in more of a suburban context as developers, which has a, been a pattern for, you know, over a couple of decades now that they're taking Grayfield sites and transitioning them into, you know, some sort of a mixed use town center. And there's a strong residential component. And we found that, you know, in addition to the larger buildings that often come along with those projects along the corridors that the missing middle once again, plays a great transition as you go from the corridor in toward the neighborhoods at, the, at those edges. And then just the creation of new communities at the edge, you know, that I showed you earlier, there's uh, a lot of good examples of that of like, hey, let's start from scratch, let's create a new walkable community and make, make Missing Middle a core component of that. And then some thoughts on, on zoning for Missing Middle. I mean, I often give an entire presentation on this, so I'm just going to just kind of touch upon this um, fairly quickly. But um, if you look at this photograph, um, what's the sad reality is that most zoning codes do not see the differences between these two buildings because they have the same front setback, they have the same height, and they generate about the same density. And so, um, right, what you need is a, 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 you need a system that can actually acknowledge that the one on the right's different, even though it's same, similar in, the, in those ways that I just discussed, and make sure that the code that you have is delivering results like the one on the left, and it does things like uh, making sure you're regulating how the building addresses the street, right? We call it frontage and does it need a porch or a stoop or some other type of way to engage that public realm and the streetscape and, and really be a good neighbor. And um, it's part of the reason we actually encourage cities to get away from a, a density-based um, zoning system. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but, you know, um, a majority of missing middle housing in cities was delivered prior to um, zoning actually being put in place. 
So uh, the, the system we currently have in place with our zoning is, is in most cities is based on a hundred year old, you know, operating system. You know, zoning was first implemented in the in the 20s and the 30s, 1920s and 30s. And so I, I often in my messaging say that it's a really out of date operating system. We just need to think about very differently about how we regulate for the delivery of these housing choices in a way that uh, most city zoning codes have not been effective. And so the part of the message about zoning is regulating a loud range of housing types, not regulating with density or FAR, just being more direct about it. And, and I mentioned this earlier, but we just all need to become familiar with the term, this new terminology of these housing types. And part of the planning and zoning process is going through this broad pellet or collection of missing middle types and deciding which range of missing middle types make sense in different locations, um, different neighborhoods and in, in location sub areas within neighborhoods and in making sure that you're regulating not just height, but the maximum building width and depth to deliver that predictability. It's a really, really important part of it. And so the, you know, when we, you know, deliver a new set of zoning districts, the form and scale and hierarchy should be really clear where it's almost, almost as simple as it should be small, medium, large in terms of what it's delivering in terms of scale of housing. In that middle is that core missing middle set of zoning districts. This is uh, just a summary of new zones we created for Cincinnati, Ohio, now about uh, eight years ago, I think it was. And just being really direct about within a zoning district of what housing types do you want? Like I said, don't make it a density, don't make it an FAR, just say these are the range of types that are allowed in that zone and define the form characteristics of it. And make sure that you're focusing on usability, clarity, and predictability uh, within the, that new zoning. Just that, That's just kind of the modern way of doing this. If you're interested in learning more about kind of what other cities are doing, we did the research for this report for National Association of Home Builders about a year and a half ago. You can download it for free online. Just encourage you to take a look at it. We looked at case studies of different cities, zoning approaches, as well as what developers are building under those codes. Um, now, parking's always a hot button topic, but you need to address parking. Um, otherwise, missing middle will not be viable. We found this in, in every city that we've worked in. Um, in terms of uh, one of the constraints is that the physical limitations on small lots just make it really impossible to actually deliver missing middle on most existing lot sizes, especially in pre-1940s neighborhoods. But, um, you know, these types of studies can really inform that conversation about, well, if we're requiring one space or two spaces, what impact does that have in terms of the number of units that a developer can build? And then ideally, you may even run some pro forma analysis. We're doing that a lot in our more recent missing middle studies. And then even just studying the, the, the economic impact of parking spaces on the cost of the housing that's being delivered. It's a, it's a really uh, valuable way to understand how your parking requirements are impacting attainability um, in your community. And so just want to mention that um, uh, we are working on what will be the largest car-free community in the country. Uh, it's called Cul-de-Sac, ironically, and it's in Tempe, Arizona. And I just want to mention this because I think this project represents a shift in uh, the demand and a shift in what households are looking for. So um, if, if car-free living is being delivered in a place like Tempe, which is part of the Phoenix Metro that has historically been a very, very auto-dependent um, culture and auto-dependent mindset, I feel it's just, it's, it's a, just sets a really great example and is sending a message that households are really looking for choices. And uh, over 50% of the households are moving from other states to live in this car-free community. So it's it's really neat to see that. Um, and then where to prioritize missing middle. Um, we've, we've created this process over the last three to four years called the missing middle scan and a missing middle deep dive. And this is a, an example from Greenville. We did both the city of Greenville and the county and we analyzed where missing middle should be applied, um, both in the city and the county, and identified specific barriers in their policy, 
their planning documents like neighborhood plans, uh, corridor plans, and, and then barriers in their zoning for missing middle. And so one thing we often do is show what zoning is allowed, sorry, what density is allowed by their current zoning districts. You can see the RM zones are their existing residential districts. The dash line represents the maximum density each of those allows. And then the green boxes show the densities that are necessary to deliver this broader range of missing middle housing types along the bottom uh, of that table. And so, and then we do these three-dimensional studies that just really clearly show you know, what your zoning allows. And in this particular instance, the zoning allowed 20 units per acre hypothetically, but on this specific um, lot, when you simply took the side setbacks into consideration, there was only a, a 10 foot wide sliver of development potential on the lot. And we all know that, you know, nothing's gonna actually happen if that's the, the condition and the regulation. And so we, in the third example here, we, we show the missing middle option and then we reverse engineer the zoning uh, to enable those missing middle types. And, you know, this is very similar to the work we did uh, with Emily and her team for the uh, for Louisville Jefferson County, uh, where we did this, um, this code di diagnosis with the real housing focus. And it was really a very similar process to that missing middle scan and deep dive. So I just encourage you to take a look at that work um, that we did with the city because it, it goes through a similar process. Um, and then cities are also prioritizing missing middle in new growth areas. And I just wanted to show this because I know there are a lot of suburban growth areas in the uh, sort of Louisville Metro. And this is a, a project we did with Iowa City, Iowa, and they prioritized this area for growth in their comprehensive plan. And then we worked with them to um, establish a mix of missing middle zoning districts and each of the purples represents a different mix of missing middle housing types that would be allowed in this growth area under the development of, of, of this targeted area for missing middle. And so uh, we'd established a palette of zoning districts to enable that. So some concluding thoughts here. Um, uh, there was a major milestone just a few weeks ago uh, that came out of Memphis, Tennessee that I encourage every city and county to do now that they recently changed their residential building code or the IRC for those of you who are more familiar with building codes to allow up to six units under the IRC instead of only um, two units. And so the third unit usually triggers the international building code or commercial building code, which triggers much higher costs, which is a major barrier for the delivery of missing middle. So I just encourage um, you know, your jurisdictions to look at your building codes and thinking about making that same change to allow IRC to uh, allow up to six units or even more under, under that residential code. So the second point I wanted to make in concluding is that, you know, these housing choices and the missing middle in particular doesn't need to seem scary. You know, um, with the thoughtful regulations, you can deliver really good results. You know, you can you know, I, I tell cities and, and counties we work with, like use photographs to deliver the message of what the intent is. And the, the message should be that this, this isn't about increasing density, but it's about increasing housing choices like this great cottage court um, that I showed at the beginning of my presentation. The second of all is part of my message is that, you know, related to the zoning and the planning is we just need a 21st century operating system that's based on a lens of form and scale and also equity now that, that we um, need to make that a priority as well. And, and uh, with that, that lens of just thinking about small, medium and large, it can be that simple of an operating system based on form and scale. If you wanna learn more, um, we launched this website in 2016. It's a free online resource at missingmiddlehousing.com. And then in the summer of 2020, my book uh, was, re was released, you can buy it. Um, at Island Press. Uh, it's available at missingmiddlehousing.com or if you have a local bookstore that sells architecture and planning books, uh, please do support them as well. And so I think what's, um, I love to plug into these conversations as, as regions are exploring housing choices because I do believe that we all play a role, whether we're planners, architects, uh, community members, decision makers, the mayor, the city manager, we all play a role, realtors, um, in addressing this uh, housing crisis that we have. And I think that the more we can learn about missing middle and utilize it as a tool, 
um, the more effective we can be in achieving the, the goals of delivering more choice and more housing stabilities in our communities. Thank you. All right, Dan, thank you so much for a great presentation. You've certainly given us a lot to think about. And what I love is a lot of good concrete examples of things that are actually on the ground in other places that are that are taking place that we can learn from here. I think that's a that's a big thing for us as we're considering how we want to move forward and tackling, you know, the housing affordability issues that are very real here in Louisville and Lexington as they are throughout the country. And I liked your term attainable housing. Uh, I think that's a really good way to frame that. So I, I appreciate uh, what you've done here. Also, I want to I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank AARP Kentucky as well. Uh, for sponsoring our keynote speaker today. So I want to thank them also. Um, also, the, the um, conversation in the Q&A has been amazing. So we've, <laughs> you've obviously got the gears turning, Dan. So we're going to um, turn our attention now to a couple of questions that we've received and, um, and see if we can't get to your question. I apologize, but we'll get to as many as we can. Um, this one is specifically uh, about developing new neighborhoods within missing middle housing. So how can municipalities encourage private developers to build missing middle instead of the standard detached $300,000 houses or large multiplex developments? So they're saying not just permit missing middle or removing barriers, but actually incentivizing construction of this desirable housing. So have you seen examples of partnerships, you know, public par private partnerships or um, other ways that localities have rapidly scaled up the development of uh, affordable missing middle housing? Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things I've seen, and I'm, I highly encourage this to every city that's having a missing middle or just a discussion about housing choice and attainability is um, develop a pilot project, you know, find a development partner, um, city play a major role. A lot of times there's a case study in my book in Georgia where the city purchased the lot, they paid for the design, and after the design was done and planning approval was done, they then found their development partner. And so the development partner knew they could come in if they agreed that they could deliver that, like there was a really clear path uh, through construction. And I know I just saw an RFP from Kenmore, Washington, that's actually they're going through a similar process as they want to demonstrate, they want to demonstrate the viability. And so I think that's a really great way to, to prove the concept, to show the market response and even give a comp, you know, economic comp in the market so that banks feel more comfortable um, sort of to funding those projects. But I, I would say that, you know, removing barriers, I don't want to downplay it because, you know, the Prairie Queen neighborhood that I showed, that's also the one behind me, it broke every rule in the city. You know, the city thought they had, th the, they thought they had done a good job of enabling and removing barriers in their zoning, but it's everything from, right, we had to negotiate the street widths um, we had to negotiate the the connections of the streets to the arterial street. You know, we had to negotiate utilities. We had uh, you know parking requirements, um, on street parking. Uh, now I'll say that the city of Papillion was fantastic. the The mayor, uh, Mayor Black, became the biggest champion of this project and basically challenged his staff to to work with us and the our client who's the developer to, to make this happen, not only make the project happen, but also reestablish their new standards um, using this project um, because um, they had a real strong um, policy of reinforcing their small town character and felt that this was a way to deliver housing choice, but also reinforce that small town character that they were super proud of and, and wanted, to, wanted to continue to reinforce. Yeah, I'll echo that. I mean, it's it's you know sometimes it's about getting out of our own way when we've got an outcome that we're looking for and we we put up barriers to that. So certainly something for us to think about too. Um, you know, and and as we talk about development, particularly here in Lexington too, we talk about infill development um, sometimes within our neighborhoods or close to our neighborhoods. And so throughout the course of this conference, you know, we're talking about development and potentially change, right? Uh, within or near two neighborhoods. And so that's difficult for, for people um, and any change is, is hard. So we've had a couple of questions come in about how ADUs might impact their existing neighborhoods. So I guess, could you speak to your experience as a housing advocate working with cities and neighborhoods as ADUs become more popular 
specifically in the infill context, but then also as they in, as ADUs increase, you know, what does that look like for impact on community facilities, infrastructure, parks, sewer, you know, with the density that comes with that? Uh, I think the my my first response to I mean that usually comes up is the concern about sort of um, infrastructure and facilities, but it happens so incrementally that um, you know it gives the city the ability to respond as it's happening. It's not you're not all of a sudden going to have three thousand units <laughs> at the point, and so I, I think. To be quite honest, I feel like, especially with ADUs, the concern about impact on facilities and infrastructure is, is I don't think it should be a concern. I think it's um, because there's such a light touch and it's so incremental. Um, I don't want to write off the concern, but I, the way we've seen it happening is it's super incremental. And, um, you know, the one thing I didn't say is, you know, the state of California had to enable ADUs at the state level because local jurisdictions weren't doing their job like like you all have done but it took like three or four years of refinements and um before it actually was being used very much and the final refinement was well one of them uh, was the removal of on-street parking requirements and it it really took that to deliver to for builders to actually start delivering edu so if you want it i mean you have to be pretty progressive otherwise it's not not going to happen and um, I, I actually, to be quite honest, it, it's hard for me to understand the concern, especially in historic sort of pre-1940s neighborhoods, because all of these neighborhoods historically had ADUs and carriage houses, and it's part of the pattern and has been. And so in those places, it just reinforces the pattern and is, is very logical. Um, and so I think it's, I just, I highly encourage it. I think it's a great first step i'm glad you all have taken that step and i just uh, you know encourage you to keep keep tweaking you know those those standards as as you're seeing how the development community responds and you know if if somebody builds an adu and it's at a scale well the one thing the state of california did too is they changed the maximum size from 1100 square foot i think down to 900 or 1000 i can't remember now i should know that but they just made that change so make it just a little bit smaller Okay, very good. And and um, talking about here in Lexington, one of the main uh, constituents or interested parties was, you know, folks looking to age in place or the senior population for ADUs in particular. Um, and a lot of what they're talking about is, is making sure that those units are accessible. So what role can missing middle housing types play in providing additional accessible housing choices? Uh, we know there's there's a demand for ADUs, and they uh, and that they have been in some cases specifically de designed with universal uh, design standards in mind. Absolutely, I mean accessibility is a key part of all of our project designs, um, and both as a requirement, but also just as a smart move for our clients. Because as I mentioned, the one of the biggest market segments for missing middle is is that aging sort of senior baby boomer population. So um this just as an example the the prairie queen neighborhood um there there's a fourplex with uh you know a, a larger two bedroom ground floor single level ground floor unit that has become super popular with downsizing baby boomers um at the point where we knew the baby boomers going to show up but they've shown up in even more larger numbers than we assumed so our, we are working with our client to adjust to make sure that there's more of those specific units. Like I said, you know, it's ground floor, it's single story and, you know, they're downsizing, but they're downsizing from like a, I don't know, a lot of times a pretty large place, you know, a 25, 3,500 square foot single family home. And so they don't want to necessarily downsize into 800 square feet, but they're super happy with, you know, 2000 or 1800 or uh, uh, square feet. So uh, uh, I, in and, and some, some like, some of my neighbors are happy to downsize into 800 square feet. So um, it just depends. But I think having that broad range of sizes, locations, and uh, choices is really part of like just making sure you're addressing that broad need and broad demand. And uh, yeah, absolutely, accessibility is an important part of that, that discussion and implementation for sure. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another 
question that's come in here. So because of the expensive ADUs, it appears that this is a housing type that exceeds the income of most black owner occupants. Are missing middle housing types increasing the opportunities for black affordable housing? And is there any information that supports this? So do missing middle housing communities allow for individual home ownership or is it mostly rental property? For some of the multiplex, oh, for some of the multiplex designs, while well, I love the idea, I wonder how they lend themselves to home ownership and worry that rents could become unaffordable. Yeah, I, I think to the to the first question about um, how missing middles delivering um, attainability in particular to black households. And uh, I would say that it's absolutely one of the objectives to um, uh, to make sure we're delivering housing choices in an equitable manner. And I know one of my colleagues, just as an example, um, here in Oakland, California, is actually working with black and brown households to educate them about the ability to buy, you know, a duplex, a triplex, or a fourplex with the same, um, uh, fan, you know, the same federal mortgage as you can a single family home, sort of giving that education so that they have the tools to actually buy that multiplex and give them housing stability and sort of to generate, you know, household wealth. I'd say, you know, this is this is too new to have really solid data about, you know, this has been done for 10 years or 15 years, but it's absolutely the goal um, to, to, to have an equity lens and just, just give households with, you know, lower household wealth, the opportunity to have, have that housing stability. I think that um, land trusts is another tool that we see both cities using and some of our developer clients or they're exploring where, you can deliver a missing middle type for sale um, at a price point that's below market rate. So a, a household with below median income can afford that. Um, and that's it. There's that's another tool to use. So there's some tools, they're all fairly new and being created, but um, I know I would be highly disappointed if if the missing middle just exacerbated the the disparity and you know, white households and black and brown households. So um, I'm always open to like ideas of working with people to figure out how to how to make that uh, equitable um, implementation happen. And um, I, I think the second question partly was for sale or for rent. And um, I'd say both, it's not one or the other. It's the, the projects I showed that are being delivered are both for sale and rental. I think there's a, a demand and a need for both of it. And I think, unfortunately, um, partly because I'm not an economist, I tell people, but I, I know this equation, low supply and high demand is the equation for a lack of affordability. So we need to be delivering more of this as a start. Um, and that's not a short term solution, but uh, we definitely need to be doing this because, uh, you know, even the projects that we worked on that were highly attainable at the first phase just because the demand was so high and it's so unlike anything else being delivered, but, right? The prices go up. And, um, but I will say that, you know, in, in the missing middle neighborhood, which is the Prairie Queen, it's rental, um, the, the, the lowest priced apartment, which is the one story, or sorry, one bedroom rents for a thousand dollars a month, which a median income household can afford. And then the largest, a townhouse unit rents for three thousand dollars a month. So there's this really broad range of, of price points that is highly unusual in a, a multifamily project that our client is achieving, and he's actually considering the next step, which is more of like a, a shared sort of communal live co living environment where he could actually achieve a you know seven six hundred seven hundred dollar a month uh, rents. Yeah, there's some really interesting things happening. We've got a, an excellent land trust here in Lexington as well. And I think that's a, an excellent model that you mentioned for trying to keep uh, properties affordable in perpetuity. Uh, Sorry, can I mention one thing? Because I, I can't believe I forgot to mention this, but Park Duval <laughs> is one of the most successful examples of d missing middle delivered at affor affordable housing prices um, in, in the country. So I highly encourage you. And I know that was developed in a historically black community. And from what I understand, it's still a, a really high percentage of black households, which when I toured it, when I was there for CNU, what a couple, three years ago now, four. 
and really impressed by by the quality of the community and the diversity of the community. Um, so that's a great case study to look at locally. Yeah, yeah, great, absolutely a great one. Um, looking at some other things, so here uh, everywhere, you know, the, the pandemic has sort of shifted some things around and we already knew that there was kind of a retail shift that was happening nationally, uh, but a lot of that sort of been exacerbated um, with, you know, and with people working from home from professional offices. So. I guess the question here uh, from someone is, you know, we know that the nature of work and retail is shifting. Have you looked at empty office and retail buildings being converted into some of that missing middle housing because the workforce just isn't using it anymore? Um, I mean, I know there's definitely efforts, uh, some of our colleagues, I know even within the Congress for New Urbanism to explore conversion of offices into housing. Um, I, 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 it's not something that I've spent a lot of time exploring. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't feel like it fits within the missing middle sort of vocabulary or typologies, but yeah, sure. Absolutely. I think the one consideration is, is it a office building in the middle of a suburban office park? That's not walkable or bikeable to anything. I feel like maybe that's not a great choice for housing unless there's also a plan to transform that into a more walkable mixed-use neighborhood which a lot of those those plans do um so i i think sure i think the missing middle housing is just one housing tool in a city's broader housing toolkit it's not it's not the sort of the the silver bullet solution it's just one tool that cities need to have in their toolkit when you talk about the breadth of that toolkit, I know you've worked on, um, you know, some some pretty significant code rewrites uh, for some cities, and yep. you know when you know you also talked about incremental development and things sort of happening incremental. Uh, but for I guess for the benefit of our you know councils and planning commissions and decision makers, you know, in your experience, how has that gone trying to do a, a wholesale? rewrite of a zoning code as opposed to a more incremental approach to changing your regulations to you know allow for some of this missing middle housing yeah um it, you know it it i would say just to be frank i'm a little bit less of a fan of the wholesale rewrite at this point and more of a fan of let's pick a few pilot areas like we did in cincinnati for neighborhoods and create a set of new zoning tools to deliver missing middle for those neighborhoods. And then let's let it be a pilot project. Let's get that done quickly, right? As opposed to getting stuck in a, a three, four, five, seven year process when your housing market goes completely crazy, right? Your market from when I was there four years ago, like it's this, it's those kind of places like, wow, it's like you're seeing the impact of very dramatically in your market where it used to be quite attainable in a majority of places, but it's it's almost not anymore. And um, so I become more of a fan of a targeted, shorter um, sort of testing of ideas because I think it's also easier to build support. And um, I guess both from the broader community and you know show some results. Um, you can go to any of those four neighborhoods in Cincinnati and see results, and then spread it spread it more broadly or or just pick the five top fixes you need to make in addition to those four neighborhoods in your, your code. It might be the administration and procedures, right? Where it's not clear the path from start to finish in an entitlement process. Um, so, you know, the use tables might just want a wholesale cleanup. Um, some those really technical things. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, it varies place to place, but I've become more of a fan of a focused, um, focused fixes. <laughs> We're, we're certainly familiar with that approach. That's an approach that we're, you know, working our way through now, too, which is part of the ADU uh, yeah. regulations that came as part of, you know, a, a bigger look at our zoning ordinances and, and how we need to change that to provide more housing options. Okay, Dan, looks like we've got one more question in the queue here. So can you speak more about the small, medium, and large approach and the shift to a form-based zoning approach that you're seeing in cities? Yeah. It seems like this would provide an easier to understand model that would lead to more predictable results, something that cities, neighborhoods, and developers could all benefit from. Yeah, absolutely. I And, and the first thing I have to say is I wrote a book on form-based coding, and I established a nonprofit called the Form-Based Code Institute to 
to establish best practice standards. So I'm a big fan of, of zoning reform. If you don't want to call it form-based coding or there's some baggage that comes along or fear that that brings, um, feel free to call it whatever you want is my first message. It's just, it's just better zoning. Um, but yeah, I think it's, you know, I think this concept of like small, medium, large, it, it could be that easy is like, and um, I think it communicates more effectively with community members. And if you've ever tried to write an intent statement for a zoning district, you'll know that it's not actually an easy thing to do. Um, and, and it's probably the most poorly crafted part of most zoning codes in terms of a clear intent statement. So if you can make it really clear about what the scale and form intent is as a start, like it goes a really long way in the function of a code. And so, um, you know, I don't think it needs to be rocket science. We, what I didn't, when I give a full presentation on, on zoning, I talk about the process of studying your existing patterns, right? That's an important part of lot sizes, lot widths, lot depths, block sizes, what types have ex existed historically, and those become the foundation, as opposed to your existing zoning being the foundation for the new zoning, that analysis through mapping and photography and maybe even some 3D analysis becomes a foundation for those new zoning districts, right? And so you can point to a picture of a existing building type and say, hey, we're just trying to encourage more of that to happen as opposed to, well, it's a density of 30 units per acre. We thought 32 was too much, 28 wasn't enough. Um, you know, like get into that numbers conversation that is so abstract and, and, and doesn't deliver predictability. So I, I highly encourage it. And obviously a part of the form-based zoning is also that usability and clarity with the use of graphics and consolidated text into tables. So all of that's really important. I, I see a lot of cities just adding graphics to their otherwise existing, their zoning code without making any changes. And I feel like that's the worst possible thing to do um, because it's, it's a code that's masquerading as something new, um, but it's actually just the same old code that has the same problems. It'd be like, taking your car in that into the shop because it doesn't work and then painting it. Um, and yeah, it looks really great, um, but it actually doesn't run. Um, so yeah, just, just need to really di dig down into and extract that DNA of your communities and, and make that the foundation and don't make it complicated. Uh, we can get away from any terminology that um, causes knee-jerk reactions in communities, but you do have to make the tough choices. And like I said, parking's one of them. And I, uh, I, and and uh, it's it's important. All right. Well, that um, is going to about do it for our questions here. But Dan, again, I I really appreciate your time and and sharing your expertise with us. Um, I want to thank again AARP Kentucky. I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, to go to missingmentalhousing.com um, and pick up the book that, that Dan has written. A lot of good stuff in there, a lot of good practical things for you to take away, especially as we're considering ADUs as a piece or perhaps a supplemental piece of the missing mental housing uh, concept and how that might fit in and some other changes that we might want to make in the future. So, uh, Dan, again, thank you. Yes. Uh, and and also, I want to thank uh, everybody else. And, and this is going to wrap up just an absolutely wonderful Louisville and Lexington ADU conference. Uh, we've had some great speakers with us. Um, I hope you all have left with some key takeaways that'll give you, you know, at a minimum, wanting some more information about ADUs and housing in our cities. But uh, maybe it's moved you to even start drafting up the paperwork for your own building permit. And that'd be great too. Uh, but you know, as a planner. And planners here, we, we have general knowledge about a lot of this stuff, but it's always good to hear from industry and practicing professionals who have a lot of expertise in the fields and can answer the questions that we really can't answer. So uh, also, we'd love to hear your feedback on this conference. So if you could, you could email us at imagine at lexingtonky.gov. If you have any comments, questions, feedback, any future topics you'd like us to, to get together and talk about, we would love to hear that. Uh, if you have specific questions about the Louisville ADU ordinance, I would encourage you to reach out to their planning and design department. 
specifically Joel Dock, uh, who was instrumental in putting this, um, this conference together. You can reach out to him at joel.doc at louisvilleky.gov. For those of you who have questions about Lexington specific ADU policies and provisions, please reach out to Chris Taylor at ctaylor3 at lexingtonky.gov. Uh, we'll try to put those contacts in the chat so that you will have them before we conclude. Also, as a reminder, we have all of these uh, sessions that have been here. So congratulations if you've been here for all six. Uh, they're all available for AICP credit for any of our certified planners through the American Planning Association. And the sessions, all the sessions we put together this uh, past couple of days will be available uh, for you all to watch in the coming weeks on imaginelexington.com. So we'd encourage you to do that. Also, we're going to try to put together a, a list of all the different resources that have been shared throughout this conference and put them together uh, in some sort of a document that we can send out to all of our registrants. So on behalf of the city's, uh, City of Lexington's Division of Planning and the Louisville Metro Government Planning and Design, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, again thank Dan, thank our speakers that have uh, worked with us for AARP Kentucky for their continued support of this conference and ADU efforts in Louisville and Lexington. Our uh, behind the scenes crew here at, at the city who have been helping us over at Lex TV. Also Libby Jefferson, Grace Coy, Sam Castro and Valerie Friedman uh, who are our technical crew making all of this happen. And certainly to you, our audience as well, thank you. I wanna invite you all to our next monthly mornings with planning webinar. Uh, we do those every month on Wednesday morning at nine o'clock. And this one, uh, next one coming up in March will be a planning director's roundtable that'll include the directors of both Louisville and Lexington, uh, as well as a couple other regional cities, and we're firming that up right now. Uh, so you can go to imaginelexington.com for more information on that. Again, this has been a great opportunity for Lexington and Louisville, like Kentucky's two biggest cities, to collaborate on an important topic, and hopefully this will be the first of many.